Hi, Case. Hi, Fred. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for coming to Sands Films. Um, it's great to get to chat to you. And the first thing I wanted to ask you is about your kind of life's work in medieval music. So many of the, the listeners may not know uh, a whole lot about this music because it seems to be kind of gen generally underrepresented in, in the music scene. So what if you had to zoom out and summarize your work in this area what would you what would you say um my interest uh started with interest in uh, in all sorts of music and sort of gradually uh grew by the time I was gradually moving out of the baroque uh, scene. Mm. Um, I felt uh, uh, an urge to enlarge my repertoire. Being a recorder player, it, um, it, it, it's a field that especially for a recorder was, was not explored uh, to any uh, serious degree. Um, and the moment that I got really interested uh, in a in a serious uh, sense I mean, in a philological sense um after a long you know participation in for example syntagma musicum the group that case Otten led in the 70s and the early 80s um we did you know, tasteful uh, interpretations of of uh, medieval and early renaissance uh, but using completely uh, the wrong uh, equipment, yeah, we played on vials and sack butts and, um, and machinery that, you know, at some point made me feel slightly uncomfortable. I said, well, does this really belong there? Um, and if we, uh, if you would use the proper equipment, so to speak, uh, what would happen to the music? Basically the same sort of question that we would... Uh, that we had asked ourselves, you know, uh, with with broke music. Yeah. And, uh, um, so um, that became more and more uh, an urgent question. And then as things go in life, um, there was just a coincidence that somebody, um, for some reason that I cannot remember, um, said, um, could you do a Chikonia uh, program in this and or that festival? Uh, and I said, yes, cool. And that's, uh, that's an interesting uh, proposition. Um, and I had a, a group at that point called the Little Consort Amsterdam, uh, which was a sort of a minimal ensemble mm. of only three people and a, and a singer, but actually only three people. Uh, with uh, Toyi Kosato, who was the lute player, and uh, uh, Walter van Aue, who I had been playing with uh, as a recorder player, and I have been ever since. Huh? And have been ever since. And am still playing when we just finished recording <laughs> something. And um, so I said, okay, I've been playing the gamba in the previous uh, incarnations of, uh, of a, a medieval, so-called medieval group. So let's this time let's uh, let's try something serious with this chikonia, which at that point was a, you know, highly un unexplored. I mean, there was one, I think, one complete works uh, edition on the market in terms of recordings. Um, and so I started looking for, uh, thinking about you know, a serious approach. And I said, okay, what sorts of instruments can I you know, extract from the iconography and um, get to some sort of approach where you would use the right, uh, mm -hmm. the right tools? Um, and that was, I think for me, was the, was the beginning. And uh, that was in, the, in 1987 or 1988. Um, so that's that's the initial impulse. But what is it, what is it about this 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 body of music, which you know spans a couple of hundred years, that still fascinates you? Is it the fact that well, so little is known, for example, about how it was performed 
in well the the repertoire i mean when when i started doing um, you know, playing with quadro there um we explored french composers french music trio sonatas um stuff that wasn't you know, had not been done at all was completely unexplored i have a i just have a a streak of uh, extreme curiosity. I I want to see more. Mm -hmm. If I know uh, there is this, then I want to see what's behind it, what's around it, where does it come from, um, and so that has been the sort of the motor behind it all. I mean, just you know, digging and digging. And of course, medieval music. You say two centuries, but it's of course um, it's it's more than that. You know, it it goes from eleven hundred until. Mm, let's say if you stay with the medieval parts, you know, until the 1400s, you know, 1420. If you include the early Renaissance, uh, you go even a little bit further. But it's a it's a vast area of music with you know with also extreme uh, stylistic diversity and changes in the course of in the course of time. Yeah. And okay, so we know the we know when it happened. We know which instruments were used according to iconography, paintings, frescoes, and stone carvings, and all that. But one of the mysteries is sort of how the music was played. Yes. Tell me about that. We don't know. There is, so to speak, no historical feedback uh, on uh, the why... <laughs> the where and the how um, about any of this music, especially if you get to the, if you like, the core uh, repertoire of the, of the 14th century, uh, when, this, when you know, polyphony really takes off in a major way uh, and gets you know, extremely individualistic in terms of, of styles and, and composers, although many of them are, uh, remain anonymous. Um, there is very little, um, very little is known about um, the why, the how, and the where um, of this of this music, and that of course is intriguing, and it means that you have to uh, you have to work by uh, hypotheses about you know, what possibly could have been um, the circumstances. By and by, it becomes uh, it becomes clear that uh, that that repertoire um, is linked to an extremely uh, sophisticated audience, if you like, or an, an extremely sophisticated group of musicians um, that were that were doing this. Um, and yes, the traces of of information about. You know the effect it would have had, or the, the or the difficulties, or the use of the instruments, um, is is remarkably uh, absent. Yeah, especially yeah. when you compare it to a couple of hundred years later, right? Yes, then we start getting a, a much uh, clearer picture. Yeah. So there's this. Um, so we don't know how, how the music really was played we don't really know how it sounded so your work i guess must be a combination of kind of intense research but also there's an element of creativity right and imagination you have to you have to be imaginative in order to imagination is the yeah, is the right word you have to be you have to use your imagination and you have to um uh how shall i say that um you have to be musical <laughs> you have to have a musical uh, instinct which tells you this is valid you know as a hypothesis you know as a as a way of approaching this mm. um as a way of hearing the result of what you're trying to do and say okay this this might be something that uh, that speaks yeah uh, and of course the only uh, uh, criterion you have is how, if it speaks to you, you know, as a musician. Yeah. Uh, if I'm convinced that uh, this is a valid yeah, musical uh, creation that, you know, that, you're, that you're putting on stage, so to speak, um, 
then you say, okay, we, we the, the, that makes sense, yeah, and so I'm on some sort of a of a road, yeah, yeah. and I think that is an element that in yeah, in so many performances yeah, or attempts at, at medieval music is completely absent. People do not ask the question, is this really yeah, music? And then you get back to the, the circumstances yeah, where and for whom yeah, <coughs> this music was performed. And then, of course, you should realize, I mean, these were yeah, people of the highest social standing um, commissioning yeah more often than not commissioning certain pieces mm. yeah of extreme sophistication and so it must have had you know, a very serious impact yeah mm. also by the fact that you know then usually later you know, a couple of decades later um, they took the trouble of writing all this material down in extremely lavish manuscripts you know mm. That nowadays would you know, cost four million uh, pounds, you know, something like that. For example, the the Chantilly Codex, which yes. is the thing, that, which is the way I got into this music and the way I we we, we met ultimately. Um, so so you're saying that the really the music was was notated at least in its kind of lavish form much after the event, right? That's all we know. Yeah, and, and so that's it's a strange common. Uh, denominator of yeah, of most of the the famous uh, medieval manuscripts that we know, whether yeah. be it Squarcialupi or Chanty or Modena or all these famous, uh, is it, they are they are compilations yeah, of of famous repertoire of just a little while before. Yeah. Do you think then that the musicians played from memory and also? How how do you think they they composed the music? Like, was it so clear in the composer's head, um, and then somehow it was transmitted to musicians? Uh, that this is also relevant to the fact that the, there there's no like score format, right? Each part is written out separately, sort of independent of the other parts. So how do you how do you explain that? And also the insane levels of precision uh, in in especially we could say rhythmic precision in some of the most uh, complex music of yes. this period um, I don't have an answer to this uh, it's one of the most uh, this is one of the the, the, the the most mysterious part of the whole <laughs> of the whole thing um, because you have to yeah, again you have to approach it you know, from from different angles and of course um if you say the level of sophistication of the music of the music itself of the music making uh, in how far is it possible to memorize that amount of complexity um i you know i have compared this i said well no, wait a minute, you should not, you know, as classical musicians, you think this is totally impossible. Mm -hmm. But if you go in a completely different, um, to a different type of music nowadays, um, you know, I've, I've compared it often to yeah, what they call new grass, yeah, which is the, the sophisticated form of bluegrass, um, which, you know, recently um, has developed into um, music of you know, music with a group of musicians of five, you know, four, five, six musicians, um, which has reached levels of um, s complexity, yeah. rhythmical, harmonic, um, harmonically, and in, in every yeah. uh, possible way. Um, yeah, two levels that you say. How is it possible that you know, that people can memorize all that you know, mm -hmm. and play? Yeah, the most incredible uh, unisons and, and stuff together. Um, but yeah, you know, all you can say is so this is just you know, this is just perfectly possible. Yeah. Without you know, writing down anything or maybe they have a little schedule, you know, sort of a harmonic uh, things or, or little things you know, mm. that that they notate, uh, but not very much more. And it's just by you know, re rehashing the same pieces and the same repertoire over and over and over again uh, that you get to these levels of, of perfection. Yeah. Um, 
where it is not necessary to uh, to write anything down mm. um, and of course the key element there which you know is true for so much historical music is that that is the only music you play yeah it's sort of the opposite of yeah, it's not you know, you, what I do. What you do, yeah. what I do. Yeah, you know, same. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. the same story. So we are versed you know, in a million different things, um, but at the time, yeah, or like this a bluegrass band like that, they don't do anything else. Yeah, you know? yeah. they start when they're four, yeah, you know, and they stop when they die, and yeah. that's and that's their medium and that's their idiom, yeah. and yeah, you, know, you you know, you get to crazy levels, yeah. You know? Especially, of course, if you, you know, if you then play with an ensemble that sticks together. Yeah. Right. Mm. Which you've, Another issue. Yeah. Which you've done quite a few times. Yeah. So let's talk about that. Mm. Um, sour cream. Uh, you mentioned Quadro de Terre. Um, what can you gain? What can, I guess, it, it's, it's, to me it feels like an increasingly difficult thing to achieve, to have a, a project, an ensemble, a band that lasts for an extended period. So what I guess what can like young musicians gain from having that experience that you just can't you can't access if you're constantly changing you know who you play with uh you can't um there is no um I say always that there's no shortcut to time mm. um to time to experience to repetition um it it is there is no way of course uh, our our teaching uh, gets better and better the level the technical level of all our students gets higher and higher um, but this particular thing if you're playing with an ensemble uh, for years and playing uh, a certain repertoire you cannot uh, synthetically uh, create out of nowhere mm -hmm. um, which it has it has to do with so many uh, invisible factors uh, mm. and feeling mm -hmm. of, you know, of what somebody is going to to do and it's intensified the fewer people you have right if you're just three people it, that becomes yeah. hyper concentrated yeah. Yeah. as opposed to you know an orchestra which may be 100 years old but yes. not quite as intense no yeah um that's something that i feel yeah. a, a certain absence of in my musical yeah. life. Yeah. yeah, the reason, of course, has nothing to do with music. The reason is, is political and social, uh, is our society um, that does not uh, allow uh, anymore for, for the luxury you know, of an ensemble staying together and sort of surviving, mm. uh, merely surviving. Uh, I, it was in sort of with shock that since I was going, yeah, looking at my own history and... Uh, we are writing this book about sour cream, and uh, it was really shocking to see that uh, the the average uh, fee, yeah, mm. for a gig, if you would like to use the word gig, um, with for example with Quadro Terre, we were a quartet, yeah, um, in the seventies, yeah, we got, you know, normally for concerts we got four hundred pounds mm. each, mm -hmm. yeah. These days, you know, um, if you get half of that each, uh, yeah, yeah. you're happy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's 50 years of inflation, yeah, yeah. Uh, not counting. So yeah. it is an, it's an absurd yeah, change yeah. Of, of level of, yeah, uh, of mm -hmm. appreciation yeah, from the powers that be. Yeah. Um, that you know that our society should have serious thoughts about, as far as I'm concerned. Absolutely. Yeah. So. So this quartet you played started playing French Baroque music, more or less, and tell us briefly a little bit about Sour Cream, what you why why it existed, what you played. Um, well, Sour Cream was a uh, the, we at the, at the beginning we called it um, an anti recorder trio. <laughs> uh, because we were only three recorders, and um, it, that was our challenge. Uh, the reason we had the group was, you know, as it, to my taste, always goes with, you know, the, with formation of groups, uh, was a pure coincidence, you know, or it was the coincidence that our teacher, uh, Franz Bruggen, um, you know, who was a very famous recorder player, 
uh, had two uh, very good students, uh, Walter van Houwe and myself, and our yeah our intimacy, if you like, mm. yeah, musically uh, became such mm. um, that we yeah that we decided to to do something together, yeah, to start playing t together and explore yeah a trio of recorders, which was a completely inexistent type of example, and since it yeah. Well, <laughs> Since a recorder trio yeah, sounds really like uh, house music yeah, or something extremely camp, um, we decided, okay, here we're going to uh, demonstrate yeah, the, the sort of the extreme opposite mm. of what you think this is going to be. Mm. And that became sort of our guideline to, it became a whole interaction with the audience. We involved theater, we involved uh, electronics, so we explored you know, very, very far yeah, out corners of what you could do with a recorder. Yeah. Mm. Um, you spoke before about imagination and your kind of endless curiosity for, for looking behind things. Um, and obviously this sour cream is, is a sort of good good example of, of, of a, a very wide view of what music could be. Um, but I wanted to ask, what's the importance for you for being curious about things beyond music, uh, be it other art forms or anything, anything that isn't music? And what, what's the value of, of sort of feeding yourself with all this curiosity and, and life stuff? In, and how do you keep that in balance with the sort of physical or technical... Or, just the, the just the general demands of being like a working musician. You know, your fingers need to work basically. So those two, the, the balance of those two things is is quite delicate. And I think you're a, a great example of somehow somehow keeping that in balance. Um, yeah. Well, in the first place, uh, I think curiosity is a is just an something you have in you and it's not limited to music you know my curiosity is not about music it's about anything uh, uh, which will yeah i mean some people have as a side uh, kick they have uh, and whatever entomology or something like that which is not my thing i'm not interested so much in butterflies or um but yeah of course there are, there are a million other things that you, you know, can get fascinated by and probably they're they're often yeah, somehow linked um, you know, I was I was educated as a uh, in school, um, you know, high school, yeah, as a what we call as a you know, in the sciences. You know, I I almost you know, pursued a scientific career mm -hmm. rather than a musical career, um, which happens to <laughs> I think quite a few musicians who mm -hmm. at some point are at that uh, those crossroads, and then you know because economically it's safer to to choose the. Um, than the scientific or whatever career, than the musical career, that's what they choose yeah. for, and remain amateur, and some very good amateur musicians on the side. Um, so I, you know, I slipped into the musical um, side of things. Um, and of course, you know, with time and getting more and more interested in, the, you know, in this medieval repertoire, um, of course, you have you get you 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 will be confronted with texts, yeah. So you get confronted with poetry. You get confronted with uh, different languages, um, and so strangely enough, I ended up being quite uh, a bit of a linguist, mm -hmm. yeah. Which was certainly not what I was interested in when I uh, went to high school. Right. Yeah, not at all. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, you know, as things develop in life, you, uh, you your interests uh, shift. Yeah. Uh, but keeping that all in balance mm. with practicing the recorder, <laughs> practicing your recorder exercises, yeah. like the med you know the medieval musicians you you described earlier. One of the things you said about them was that they only did that. Of course, they may yeah. have been uh, extremely educated or extremely mm. curious people, but. But their their kind of their path was quite narrow in that sense. Yes. Whereas your path is like branching all over the place, mm -hmm. and and I feel like mine sort of is too in a way to, a, to yeah. maybe to a lesser degree. But I and I struggle to 
to keep that in balance. So I don't know. Do, do you get what do you get what I mean? Well, you probably do more uh, variegated things uh, because you move between jazz and medieval music, etc., etc. So um, more than than I used to do. Mm -hmm. uh, I follow uh, more the. A general path of. But you, know, well, you play of, contemporary music. You play yeah. baroque music. You compose. Yeah. You make olive oil. Yeah. You're <laughs> lang you make wine. You know. You travel. You blah blah blah. It's endless. So. Um, yeah. I, there's. It's. It's a tricky. Well, it's, yeah. I mean, you. You, <laughs> you should be lazy, and. Uh, yeah. yeah. And I guess you need to. You, you need to like to uh, to do yeah. things. Yeah. I'm a doer. Mm -hmm. I cannot. I cannot you know, sit on the beach for two hours uh, mm. reading a book. I just can't. Uh -huh. I just can't do that. I see. Uh, yeah. And if I, you know, if I say I go, I, I go on a holiday, or anything, I, then that's what I do. Yeah. That's also a, 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 yeah. a focused effort, not effort, but they say, okay, now I'm going to do that. You know? Yeah, I see. Now I switch off all the rest. Yeah, you need to be able to, you know, to, to compartmentalize, mm. you know, your life and you know, and switch from one thing to the other very rapidly. Mm. Um, yeah, that's a technique I would say, sort of a mental technique that you learn over you know, over yeah. time. Yeah, yeah. You know, plus, yeah, for example, you know, spend enormous times, you know, amounts of time uh, in my life you know, teaching. Mm. You know, so combining you know, your playing career and your teaching career. Uh, yeah, I guess in teaching, all those things sort of get channeled into one into one place. Um, Potentially, if you've got an interesting student, maybe. Yeah, which is not always uh, the case. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you know, a lot of time you uh, you feel I should be doing some <laughs> something else. You know. uh, but that's yeah, just but the practical uh, yeah, practical side of things. You have to also in order to be have the freedom to do certain things. You have to sort of financially make yourself independent, and, and that uh, I think my generation was was fortunate there that we you know, we could really, uh, you know, yeah, be be that way. You so know. you've always been a free. You've had teaching positions, but you've always been a freelance musician. Yeah, never and that was a tight. lot. Was, when I moved to Italy in the, in 1980, you know, I stayed I stayed a freelancer for ten years, and I just taught uh, master classes and uh, private students, uh, but no, I didn't have a regular conservatory. Why did you time. move to Italy? Uh, because I wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> it was a, a, yeah, it was a completely not a practical decision mm. uh, because I actually, I left my conservatory job in, uh, in Holland, in Amsterdam, but it was, uh, I always think in retrospect that the, uh, the 80s, the arrival of the 80s, um, at least for my generation, you know, being a, a 68 uh, person, um, having lived that whole um, sort of glorious uh, period of, of extreme you know, liberty, if you like, of mm -hmm. possibilities and, and anything goes. Um, but by the time that that was over at the later 70s, you know, yeah. I think we felt that very strongly. And I, you know, in a city, living in a city like Amsterdam, um, that change of mentality, mm -hmm. uh, became, I found really oppressive. Mm -hmm. uh, and I didn't, I couldn't identify with that. Uh, anymore, and I said, "What am I doing? Am I going to spend the next uh, f whatever it was at that point? You know, thirty-five years of my life doing this same thing?" Mm. And I couldn't see that. Yeah. At the same time, I had you know I had been on tours to Italy and uh, doing master classes there, and had taken a, you know, a great, great liking to the you know, Italian lifestyle. I just you know, I felt so at home being there. Especially Tuscany, right? And then especially Tuscany. And what was it like when you arrived? What was it like in in Pitigliano when you first lived there? Uh, Very different to how it is now, I imagine. Yes, of course, because uh, you know, tourism has increased and uh, uh, everything, yeah. 
everything changes, but it's still you know, a, an extremely beautiful place to be. Yeah. Then you know, intrinsically, it's the same the same landscape that you're that you're living in. Um, it was an extreme, you know, it was an extreme decision, and I never for a moment regretted it. Uh, yeah. There were sort of two weeks that I thought, what, what, the, what the fuck am I doing? What, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, is this real? Because it was very remote in relation to all your work, I guess, Extremely right? Extremely remote, yeah. yeah. And so for all the tours that we did, and so I had to drive, I drove to Fiumicino to Rome yeah, mm -hmm. airport, which was a two and a half hour drive, and yeah, parked the car there and mm. two planes. I mean, it's hard to imagine now how you organized all that, yeah, but, yeah, uh, yeah. but you did anyway. Well, you had, but the great thing about that that period was that you had, you would make you would make a program, a project, maybe you would record it, and then you'd, you'd tour the program for, yeah. for months, it's, right? Well, not months, but for, you know, if you would do a big tour, you, know, you would play the same program, you know, 20, yeah. 20 times over. Yeah, day after day, yeah, but maybe a one day a week she didn't. Yeah, but like rock groups do. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that is a that is a fantastic experience mm. uh, because uh, once you've played a program, yeah, or usually we went on tour with two different programs. Once you've played that, yeah, uh, uh, five times over. Yeah. You know, then you you don't have to think about anything uh, you just go on stage and you yeah. and you dig you know as much you take as many risks also in playing yeah, as you can mm. um yeah all those invisible things yeah, start happening that like, you cannot yeah. teach that you yeah. cannot learn that you only yeah they happen if you're with the right people together yeah. in the right ambiance in the right audience and uh, things happen that yeah, and these days, you know, I notice it now. I mean, it's uh, at some point at the beginning of the interview, you mentioned the sort of the, the for me, a little bit of cursed word project. Yeah. You know? Everything is a project these days. And a project is basically a meaningless you know, uh, effort <laughs> because it means you, you invest an enormous amount of energy, research, preparation. Yeah, and so on and so forth. Yeah, into something that you do then once. Yeah, yeah in some festival, mm -hmm. uh, and that's it. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, the first time we, you know, you, you know, the first time you play your concert, is like the, it's like the general rehearsal. Sure. It's only after you've done it for real once mm -hmm. that you know what it actually is. Yeah, and it's only when you get to number four or five that it becomes to sort of sit yeah. in itself. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you never, with all these projects and all these programs nowadays, I mean, including what I'm doing, you, mm -hmm. you never uh, get to a point where you say, okay, this is now a routine, yeah. uh, the positive routine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's it's, you play only a series of premieres, yeah. uh, which well, are never... the same in contemporary music and yeah. early music. Oh, God, in contemporary music, there's you know, a composer who composes a whole piece, it's performed once, Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's and even more extreme there. yeah it's even yeah. more extreme yeah but there is nevertheless this connection um between early music and contemporary music it seems like a lot of people who are interested in early music at some point they also gravitate towards new music including yourself i don't know in which order that happened but um and maybe sour cream would probably sort of Philosophically, you were in both places, yeah. at least those two places. Yeah. So what what is that connection, do you think? Well, of course, for myself, you know, being a recorder player, it had everything to do with the fact that, that uh, Bruggen, my teacher, uh, very much you know, stimulated. You know, he saw the... Uh, the limitations and the possibilities of the recorder you know, mm -hmm. as a as a vehicle mm -hmm. uh, for music, and so he very early on decided to stimulate composers and say write something for this instrument. So mm -hmm. he would, and that of course, if you have that as an example, you immediately open up uh, to that possibility. Plus the fact that I was never, you know, my my own bring, upbringing you know, as a musician had nothing to do with early music whatsoever. I was brought up with uh, Alban Berg and with uh, 
and Richard Strauss and Schubert and go and so on and so forth. I mean, when I was little, early music hardly existed. Yeah, and you were a cellist, right? Uh, late, well, yeah, since I was like 12 or so, I, then I uh, studied cello. Mm. But so the whole accent on early music didn't uh, didn't happen until much later when it it you know as it happened you know I stuck to the recorder because I was somehow had a link to that uh, to that particular instrument and um, so then of course you know, with sour cream it became you know it, it became an, another level of of integration of yeah. the early the early instrument the, the early uh, music. Uh, approach, uh, contemporary music, and everything in between, but also criticism of the, you know, of the the early music approach and the yeah. authenticity and all that, and that's it's a bit remarkable, you know, to, that we very early on with sour cream, we already saw the, um, sort of if you like the drawbacks of you know an only a philological approach. You know? mm -hmm. And it's not that we were against, because that's what we were doing with Quadro Tater was making the most you know, stylistically pure, perfect you know, interpretations of, of something like French music, which mm -hmm. needed that. But at the same time, with sour cream, we already started you know, putting that under a critical uh, yeah, uh, magnifying so glass. The uh, feeling that just one, you know, the historical approach in and of itself may not be enough just by itself. No. You need a lot of imagination. You yeah. need a lot that, of risk the, taking. The musicianship. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. Do you think that's a... Would you say that's a sort of general problem in in the scene? In the kind of... At the... Yeah, at the moment. Like yeah. The, I guess I mean the standard... There's a, there's a huge standard, standardization of interpretation I so, mean of course I'm generalizing to a massive degree but if we you know if we zoom out a bit it seems like if you you know if you listen to how instrumentalists played at the beginning of the 20th century and you listen to those earliest recordings they all sounded so different so so different yeah um and I, I don't know maybe maybe it's nostalgic this <laughs> opinion but uh, what what do you think a style that becomes uh, so stagnant, you know, if you like, that everybody, yeah, they learn from. Of course, the recording industry has an enormous impact there. That you, know, there's an example of any type of music now that you, you know, any piece, you know, mm. which of course didn't exist uh, earlier on. And again, you cannot make a synthetically create a situation where that isn't true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's there, and sure. that's how it is. Yeah, so if you want to detach yourself from that, you have to use completely different tools mm -hmm. um, in order to yeah to get some some results. So if you're if you're advising you know young musicians interested in early music who are approaching new repertoire, what would you say to them? What should they do rather than just go on Spotify and listen to their favorite recordings of that piece? Because if you do that, you're just gonna end up probably sounding a bit like that. Yeah, you need a you know, because you need a very strong personality to go against yeah, something that's piped into your brain, yeah, from the outside. Yeah. So it's either you have to not listen to it at all and find your own uh, way, mm -hmm. which yeah, I must confess is something that I still do. You know, if I if I find new pieces uh, in the in the early uh, Early, early repertoire. Um, uh, there is because there is basically now a recording of of anything on the planet. Uh, there is. It's hard to avoid that somebody else has not in some corner of, you know, of the world has done uh, a recording of it. But I usually, uh, I totally avoid listening to any other um, interpretations of that given piece. Uh, but it's also because I'm extremely trained in you know, finding out uh, what a piece is all about. Yeah. And that is something, you know, that is what you have, to, it's another thing you have to learn, and which is basically, it's also um, a matter of experience. And for experience is, again, there is no shortcut. Mm -hmm. yeah, you cannot say, here's your package of how you, how you figure out a piece, you know. Um, 
and I must say my uh, my teaching at the moment and when I teach medieval music is uh, is is basically about that is this how do you find out uh, what to do uh, with a piece of music uh, when just you have from this. a from a piece of paper yeah from a piece of paper yeah and so this taps into this kind of, well the, the subject of the lecture that you're giving um, tonight which will also be um, streamed and available available for people to watch um, the title of which is music as science so when you're analyzing a piece of old music or any music if you're not going to listen to a recording to take a shortcut you i guess this is relevant to the topic of your of your lecture right yeah i mean that is of course a slice of of repertoire a very specific uh, repertoire um it, it's one the title yeah it's one element of uh, of looking at uh, music, yeah, but, but through a bit through the ages, you know, mm. as we would say, uh, how uh, how from the the Middle Ages uh, onwards, this uh, the influence of a, of the scientific approach to to what music is, yeah, you know, uh, how that that worked out, mm. yeah, you know, how that manifested itself. That's what the lecture is uh, is about. Yeah. Um, but departing from the idea that you know that music was considered one of the sciences, uh. I guess uh, thinking of it from a from a analytical perspective, that when you're confronted with something that you don't understand, you need well a lot of experience, a lot of curiosity, a lot of uh, input from all sorts of areas, a lot of imagination, but a lot of just analytical powers to figure out what the hell it means. Mm. Um, yeah you know not before we even get into the topic of early notation systems which, yeah, which are sort of that's uh, a detail yeah. yeah um and how does this all relate to composition how and why no not how why do you compose music um well i have always Felt, you know, I'm a I'm a Sunday composer. I don't know if that's an expression, but it's. So I only have written pieces when I felt mm. um, a, a certain need to to do so. Mm. Um, and the need was, uh, I always say, it's a, it's a reflection on uh, on music. Mm. If I write a piece, is to to get hold of a certain aspect of of uh, how music works, mm -hmm. and try to uh, translate that into composition, yeah, so reverse the reverse the process. Uh, so maybe a little bit hard to it's, understand what I'm. So it's always. Do you mean that sort of big events in your life trigger? some sort of impulse well mu yeah musical events uh, so you, at some point you start asking yourself well, why is this so why does this impress me so much yeah mm -hmm. musically yeah uh, then you get of course the whole analytical process mm -hmm. well, that's what i say so it's 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 sort of reversing an analytical process and say okay if that and that and that, that triggers that uh, so if i reverse that uh, what will what will happen yeah, yeah. in writing a composition but you know it, all my pieces have a very different have a different origin. There are pieces that were triggered by a text. You know, there were people there were pieces that were, yeah, triggered by a mechanism. Um, and then you know, in the end, but not at the moment, you realize that there are certain um, there are certain uh, what will you say um, threads. You know. Uh, that run through all your compositions over a long, uh, over decades, you know, mm. and that are always the same things that uh, keep fascinating you. They're sort of part of your DNA. It, yeah, it can be triggered by various, uh, mm. uh, by various uh, curiosities. Again, I mean, my first real piece uh, I wrote for 
for my buddy, recorder buddy, uh, Walter, because we were playing duo constantly together. And I felt, yeah, I felt the I was very interested in doing contemporary stuff, but then also experiment. I got interested in electronic use of uh, amplification. Um, it was even too early for uh, uh, further electronic manu manu manipulation at that point, mm. but it was, you know, amplification was there. And I said, oh, how is this going to be interesting uh, for a recorder? And then I got interested in saying, okay, what is happening if you're singing in a recorder? Yeah, and because it completely modifies the sound. Mm -hmm. um, and I brought that then to an extreme in writing a piece for, yeah, for independent voice and recorder playing yeah, at the same time with two people. So it's a four part you know, composition. Mm. What's the um, name of that piece? It's called uh, Punto. It's called Four in Three in Two in One, uh, and so it has all sorts of the layers in there are sort of the experiment of yeah you know, what happens if you you have a yeah you know, it, it's very difficult you know? yeah yeah <laughs> and it's, uh, and you recorded it right like we can, yeah yeah, yeah. Can, it, it's online you can buy the CD yeah, and, yeah, yeah you yeah. can buy yeah. whatever yeah yeah um, what is actually special about the recorder, why, what what does the recorder do that that nothing else can? I think it's um, many things have been said about it. Um, of course, the, the the main characteristic is that it's sort of primitive. It has no. It has no keys. It is just a piece of, it's a piece of wood with holes. Uh, um, it's uh, it's the trick of it, if you like, uh, is here. Yeah, mm. it's uh, the wind way and uh, and the, the fipple. Yeah, that makes it things. That is actually in terms of construction, construction uh, and the inner bore um, is much more sophisticated than a simple instrument. Yeah. yeah. And of course, over the years, uh, we have understood uh, how um, how precise an instrument that actually is. Mm. Um, but yeah, you know, all that said, um, it is an instrument with a, with an extremely small uh, dynamic range, mm. uh, and also with a small tessitura if mm. you like you know two octaves you know if you're lucky you can go a little further mm. uh, but you know like renaissance recorders don't even get there they yeah. have an octave and a fifth and that's the end of it um so it's uh, significantly it, less than the classical indian singer we heard last for night. example yeah. yes less than the singer that's yeah. sort of quite limited isn't yes it? um and so the challenge uh it becomes how to make music with something like that, mm. you know? and that has been, uh, I think, a watershed that uh, that Bruggen, mm. yeah, has been the person, yeah, and he, he deserves all the credit for that. Mm. Um, is that he made the instrument into a serious? Yeah, he showed that yeah, you could actually yeah make very serious music with mm. this with this primitive instrument, yeah, mm. and it takes off from there. And of course now you know, we have we have so many types of recorders that that's uh, mm. that's one way in overcoming the the limitations. But that's the fast. It's a fascination now, of course, to yeah. to realize. And is it connected to singing? Very much. Yeah, it's of course it's in that sense it's a, it's an extremely physical instrument. Yeah, it's next. Yeah, it's directly yeah, next to singing. It's probably the most immediate because it's it's governed by your breathing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so again, I mean, you're very close to yoga and to um, disciplines uh, that are concerned with with breathing and what you do with your breath. So, yeah, it, that is also an important an important part. Mm. Mm. But nevertheless, you play other instruments, including the viola. Yeah, viol. Why, why not just one instrument? Why are you a multi instrumentalist? That was also a, it's just a coincidence. My my mom you know, taught the cello, 
and the piano. And uh, I have absolutely no talent for keyboards. Uh, of course, she tried to teach me the piano, and I was just, I couldn't. Mm. I had no, I had no relationship. But maybe in that sense, you know, it's, a piano is very far removed from a recorder. Because a piano is a, is a machine, yeah. and you move your fingers on the machine. A bowed instrument yeah, is already much more physical, because what you do with the bow and the string mm -hmm. yeah, is a very physical mm -hmm. activity, and what you do with your, with your strings, with your left hand, is too. Yeah. Uh, and of course, a recorder is basically is your body, like yeah. with singing. Yeah. And so it somewhere sits there, I suppose, that mm. uh, my f I don't have that feeling for a, a keyboard yeah. uh, instrument. But with the cello, it went differently. And so I started playing, uh, learning the cello. And I went to conservatory uh, levels, you know. But by that time, uh, by that time, I had to, I had to choose because with the recorder, I had started with Guadalupe de Terre, uh, and so I was already in a you know, in a professional yeah. uh, s situation you know, with the group sort of taking off. Mm. Uh, but nevertheless, well. you did maintain um, the gamba and then the yeah. Viola. I decided I s to switch mm. you know, and said, okay, I abandoned the idea of playing you know, romantic repertoire on the on the cello or what contemporary or whatever, um, but. I was you know, very interested in consort music and viol, uh, viol consorts. Yeah. I really was attracted to that. So that was the move to into the Renaissance, mm. uh, so to speak. And I seriously yeah, thought that that was something I uh, mm. I had an ambition in. Uh, so obviously the disadvantage of, of um, playing more than one instrument is that you you don't have it as much time to yes. dedicate to that's mm. obvious what would you say are the benefits if if any instrumental perspective oh that's it um you know it fertilizes uh, mutually there's no doubt about it if you know um if you know what it is to uh, to deal with this with a bow and a string and how the tone production is there um is extremely beneficial to uh, to record a playing, mm. uh, for a simple fact, and it's something you know uh, that uh, you use a lot in teaching uh, to explain, mm. because people that only play the recorder, uh, yeah, you, they uh, they blow into the instrument, but they have no sense of uh, of that the the duration of a note yeah, depends uh, is something you have to feed yeah from millisecond to millisecond. Mm. They have, don't have a sense of. Yeah, a note is produced, yeah, mm. because they just say, okay, I do her, and that's my whatever note I'm playing. Mm -hmm. um, the bow you, is pretty short, right? <laughs> like the bow is short, so this that one means especially. Yeah, it, it means you need a special control and divide yeah. you know, the time over the length of the bow. Plus, that you have to physically you control every moment that you are making the length of the note. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whereas with breathing, or when you're not an, you know, a real, um, an experienced recorder player, you're not aware of that. You're not aware that every moment of, mm. you know, of your breath is actually feeding a note into the instrument. Yeah. And that realization yeah, is fundamental. Mm. If you don't know what that is, uh, you're useless. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah.